Well, good morning, everyone, who has got up very early this morning to come and join us for this uh, first panel of the day. Um, before we get started, I would just like to uh, do a traditional acknowledgement of country to the First Nations people from where I come from, which is something that is traditional for us to do at the beginning of all uh, events, uh, when we, uh, particularly public events. So I just want to acknowledge the Wurundjeri, Woi, Wurrung and Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation in Melbourne, which you uh, might be familiar with Melbourne, uh, Australia, and just pay my respect to their elders past and present. And uh, obviously that's where I create all of my knowledge in that place, but just want to acknowledge all of their, uh, their knowledge and experience and, and the importance to that, uh, of us um, to us in Australia. Okay, so our session is looking at the modernising education for future generations, and we have a really fantastic panel here. Uh, and just for some additional context to me being here as moderator today, I was for five years chair of the National Centre for Student Equity in Higher Education, which is the Commonwealth of Australia uh, Policy, Research and Practice Centre. And uh, in that capacity, I remember over the last few years that transition from looking at various equity groups, whether it be women in non-traditional areas, people with disabilities, people from regional and remote areas, and that change over the last few years to all of a sudden everybody being an equity student because of the nature of how education was delivered in so many countries and in Australia as we lived through really long lockdowns. And so that idea of equity has really changed in the last couple of years. And the other point as well is the really strong relationship between Australia and South Asian countries in particular. We have so many international students from across the region. We have really strong research partnerships. So the education system in this region and in Latin America as well, really important part of the bilateral relationships and multilateral relationships. Uh, so that's the sort of context that I sit here with as the moderator today. So the way we're going to run this session, if everybody's happy, I might uh, start at the top of this list here. Everyone's going to have about five minutes to make some comments. And as the audience, I would love for you to think of some questions for our panellists as well. So what we'll do after that is pass over to you for questions. And if you're all feeling a bit quiet or a little bit tired from last night, I'll jump in and, and I've got some questions as well for our panellists. So if everybody's happy, we shall get started and I'll pass over to Dr. Abdullah Rashid, who is the State Minister of Education from the Maldives. Assalamu alaikum and very good morning uh, to all the uh, distinguished speakers, panel members and participants. It gives me a great pleasure to participate this important uh, event Bay of Bengal conversation yesterday also, uh, our knowledge and experience is really enriched because of uh, very productive uh, panels and experienced speakers. And today's topic for us, modernizing education for future generation, I can say it is a very, very important to modernize education because the world is changing. The demands for the labor market is changing. As we know, uh, in the history, at first it was the uh, Stone Age, sorry, yeah, it was Stone Age, after that Bronze Age and Iron Age. So the demand for the e technology people use in the world is changing. And then after the uh, invention of Industrial Revolution 1, Industrial Revolution 2, and now we are in Industrial Revolution 4.0. So the demand, uh, the labor market is totally changing, new jobs. Uh, new technology is using. And today's students, when they join in the labor market, the technology they will be using is not yet invented. And also the kind of skills and knowledge they require for their job, we don't know. Therefore, we have to modernize education. As we, as we all know in the past, even, even in now, most of educations in the world, we are giving emphasis on content. We, we think that the more knowledge we, pro, we give to the students, that's better. And also, uh, the result is very much emphasized. I'm sure uh, 
South Asian countries, not only South Asian, in most of the countries still, we believe that good student is the one who produced the better result. But in reality, that's not how the labor market needs. Our students should be equipped with 21st century skills. Therefore, education should be modernized. In the school, if we give emphasis on content, if we teach students in the learner-centered, making students as passive listeners, and the teacher teaches everything, and then uh, at the end of the semester or at the end of academic year, students do the uh, a test and get the result, when they join the labor market, they don't know how to apply that. Therefore, they will be out of date and they will not be ready for 21st century labor market. In the 21st century labor, labor market, they should be equipped with 21st century skills. That is why modernizing education is important. Thank you. Thank you very much for those uh, remarks and really good contextualization around skills, which I think is you know, that match between the labor market and the education systems. So now I'll pass over to the Vice Minister for Education from Ecuador, Andres Chiriboga. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, the, the topic that's, that was sent for us uh, from Papyrus to Pith on modernizing, modernizing, modernizing Education for Future <coughs> says in one of the sentences that we received, um, nevertheless, these figures that education is better now uh, overshadow the reality that the wealth of the nation, not the talent, dictates the children's educational destinies. I want to start with that idea. Um, Thank you very much to the Center for Governance and Studies for the kind invitation of the Bay of Bengal conversation and for allowing me to uh, share this panel with such distinguished speakers. It's a pleasure to me uh, to be in Bangladesh for the first time in my life. As I learned the topic I just read uh, and the way it is presented, hopelessness filled my head for several days. Sadly, it's not a new feeling for me when it comes to education. So, uh, when you work consists in managing a country's educational system like mine, sometimes reality hits you so hard you must try just as hard to find the strength to keep doing the job with, uh, within and in spite of what hit you and shocked in the first place. But events like this provide the opportunity to discuss hard but also joyful subjects in an encouraging manner. I will confess I rewrote these this, this words several times several times, because when you talk about education, it's easy to string different ideas and approach different subjects. Education is a vast topic and often a complicated one. Nonetheless, it was about time to address topics like this, issues that, although initially uncomfortable, are urgent to discuss. So, as I was saying, since I first got the invitation to this panel, not a single happy idea come to my mind uh, about what I could share today. In <clears throat> I really kept, reality keep uh, hitting. I decided to focus on the dimensions of education that make in the future of human development. In my family, education was always important. In Latin America, but I guess throughout the whole world, parents used to tell their children that the only thing that they will surely inherit is, here, is education. Of course, my parents weren't the exception. That phrase has different meanings depending on the family and, of course, depending on the country where it is said. But to be fair, it has also different meanings depending not only the country, but the city, the neighborhood, and even the school. This is what I call the individual dimension of education. The first dimension of the efforts in education is an individual one, the effort that family or a person makes to change the reality that surrounds them. In the so-called Global South, countries like Ecuador or Bangladesh, individual efforts must not be considered, considered as, isolate, as an isolated enterprise that only responds to selfishness or the will to move ahead or even abandon the society where we live, but an attempt to change despairing individual or familiar circumstances. In other cases, such, de such decision is the way in which some families try to preserve and hold on to what they have achieved. The truth is that people betting on education can surely change their immediate and long-term future if this bet is sustained by future generations in that same family. Education is not a fast track to luxury, but a way to keep a steady growth and improving circumstances. However, these efforts can't bring, 
can bring about large scale social progress and could lead people to think that improvements are the result of individual merits exclusively and consequently believe that the people left behind have created the conditions in which they are or lack the skills or competences to create a better reality for themselves. This is especially worrying in youth nowadays because the, this individual merit approach erodes civic sensibilities. And the more we perceive ourselves as self-sufficient individuals, the harder it is to learn about humility and gratitude, to paraphrase Michael Sun. It's also worrying because individual education efforts alone are not aligned with a country's reality and its domestic needs. They generate division and polarization in societies sometimes. And this is where individual efforts must join the second dimension of education, collective efforts to educate. Education has proven to be the best way to meet not only individual needs, but also to achieve collective, societal goals. Education is without any doubt the fundamental element of human development understood as the process to expand the capabilities of people and societies. Governments know this, and they have invested in education more or less for the past two centuries. And it's not possible to deny that societies have changed in many senses for better. Education has not only shifted the way we are employed, but the nature of work, communications, relationships, and crucially, the way we understand and implement human rights. So the world has evolved through education, but can we say that education itself evolved? More people in the world are educated than ever before. And illiteracy went down from 88 to 14% in two centuries, as we explained in the presentation of the topic. And this has been considered part of the problem when we say that the high numbers of people with education around the world essentially don't make the difference. When, and I quote, these figures overshadow the reality that the wealth of the nation, not the talent, dictates the children's educational destinies. This affirmation is true when, you think, when we think only about the individual dimension of education. But if you consider that education has a collective point of implementation, you may see that the wealth of the nation is actually dictated by the educational destiny of, of a society. That means that the problem was not created by the education, but must be solved by education as usual. However, governmental efforts as the collective response to educational needs, I, I, I'm, I'm finishing. It's okay, <laughs> I mean, keep going, you're fine. Uh, as the uh, issues about education are taken into consideration uh, and respected. This is not easy because we are educating kids, as you said, a doctor, minutes ago, for an unpredictable and unknown future. More than 30 years ago, when I started my formal education, my family and my school taught me things designed to deal with a world more or less predictable. The tools they were giving me at the time would allow me to live in a world that right now is some or more or less the, the, the way they, were, they, they think it will be. But for new generations, the question at hand is what were we preparing our children for and what world will they live and work in? 20 years from now, we will know if our strategies were the right ones and we will be judges for decisions we make today. So one conclusion is that regardless the dynamic nature of education, governments must guarantee that nobody is left behind, that we are providing the best resources we can and that we are learning from education about how to enhance the education, how education must change. The main conclusion, however, is that we must keep betting on education if we want more democratic societies. Education is the great equalizer. Education is the safe bet, it's also the right one, the fair one, a bet that must evolve in order to give children the necessary tools, resources, and opportunity to develop skills in an intentional manner and push societies forward without leaving anyone behind. Let, please, education lead the way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Vice Minister, there's something I want to pull up from your presentation then, which I thought was really interesting, is you've got all of these, you know, as the great equaliser, you have all of these institutional and policy drivers that you can use, but you mentioned the role of culture and family around education, and it reminds me of something that my father used to say to me, <laughs> and I, wrote, I madly wrote it down, and education gives you options, right? Thank and you. I think that, that's, that's actually what drove my education, absolutely. Okay, so we'll move on now uh, to the former Education Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Islam, for five minutes of remarks. Uh, thank you very much for providing me the opportunity to speak before this August gathering. And Assalamu alaikum, a very good morning to you all. To me, education is the most important sector in the human life, as well as for the nation to develop. And uh, for that matter, we must uh, keep in mind the objectives of education. What are the objectives with which 
we will proceed to earn the education to achieve the goal. The first objective is probably the uh, preparation of manpower for future. And the second objective, it is also very important that we concentrate much on research and development. This is very important as such because we are living in an area in which the development is not up to mark as in the West. And for that reason, whenever we get some technology from West, we must blend it so that it suits our country, our nature, our society. This is very important. And for that matter, when Ford Industrial Revolution is knocking at door, the next uh, technological advancement that will be in the sector of artificial intelligence, drone technology, robotics and others. So we must be careful. Since we are living in a global village, we cannot isolate ourselves from other part of the world. And so uh, we must prepare to have an international standard in our education sector. Maybe since we are thickly populated, we will concentrate more on numbers in the uh, primary and secondary level. But for higher education, we must not compromise the quality. This is very important. Because, you know, in the higher education sector, you are to compete with the whole of the world. And other uh, countries, when they will be acquiring advanced knowledge, if you are left behind, so you are in the darkness. In this matter, I will lay emphasis on two things. First thing is development of curriculum for the uh, developing countries and underdeveloped countries. It is very important that we update the curriculum regularly. And if we don't update the curriculum, we will be left behind. And the next one is, to update the curriculum, we also require sufficient educational equipments and other supports, technical supports. For that matter, we have to rely on uh, some or other on the West. And so we should send our people to West to acquire that knowledge so that they can impart it into, uh, impart it into uh, our education system, induce it into our education system. Uh, you know, to accelerate the progress of uh, any nation, there is no alternative but to educate the nation. And for that matter, in our part of this uh, world, we see that the governmental leaders are reluctant to invest in education. But different studies show that investment in education is most rewarding. And in, in, in investing in education sector, the return you get is the maximum. So uh, our uh, allocation, budgetary allocation in the education uh, sector should uh, increase. Not only increase, it should increase manifold. This is very important. That if you don't get money, if you don't have the resources, then you cannot develop your education system up to the level you require. Another thing is a very important for this part of the world, our demographic advantage. You know, we in, in the West and in the developing uh, developed countries, the population is reducing. And in our country, the population is uh, not reducing at least. And the young number of young population is uh, quite substantial. So if we can uh, equip these young people, young minds, and the young generation with the modern education, they can find employment all over the world. So the demographic <coughs> advantage which we have got, uh, this part of the world, we must utilize it to the maximum. Uh, this is very important to export our manpower to waste as well as to other countries where they lack manpower support. This is, uh, I think, very important for us uh, sourcing our employment so that there is no unemployment uh, uh, situation in the country, which may also create some political unrest, this unemployment. And the last but not the least is the uh, 
preparation the for fourth industrial revolution our education system our universities uh, in this part of the world except india they are not preparing enough for the fourth industrial revolution we must take this into no consideration that if we cannot match the world international standard in uh, education sector we will not be able to cope up with this fourth industrial revolution outcome thank you very much thanks very much minister i think that what you you've you've touched on a few things there that perhaps we can talk about in the questions but uh, if I may just say one thing first, is that you've talked about the importance of, the, of local quality education and sitting here as an Australian, where the pathway, you know, for so many Bangladeshis is, or oh, we want to go to Australia for an education, and then that's a pathway for a visa. But actually what we need to be doing is building that capability here within your institutions, whether it's higher education, schools and so on, so that that actually builds up the entire country, right? Because otherwise you end up with that brain drain and that continues yeah. and perpetuates. So I think that's something perhaps we could talk about more in the questions. It's really interesting. Okay, um, okay we need to move on. Uh, so the next speaker is Sabul Khan, who is chairman of the Daffodil International University in Bangladesh. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. I hope that uh, as we, everyone is aware that before 100 years back, the total Literate people was 12 percent, but now the illiterate people is 14 percent. So that means there's a tremendous change is going on in the whole world. And definitely before 1971, if we're going through the British education system, I think in that time the education system was depend on the values, ethical practice, and they, their focus was that to get the good job. So what was the basic? I think our honourable uh, minister from the Maldives he also rightly mentioned that good student can create or can contribute a lot of things. But now the scenario is changed because due to cause of technological development, as our former education minister, Sheikh Shahidul Islam has already mentioned, due to cause of technological development, a lot of disruption is going on. So this is the time not to consider only for the good student. Rather, we should focus creative-minded student. You know that the creative-minded student, technological fascination or technological, I think, focus should be the one of the key criteria because a lot of cases may be one creative minded student can contribute a lot to the society rather a good student but i don't like to undermine the good student of course in our society we need the good student but i think this criteria or the definition of the good student need to be changed now because why because you see earlier stages as i mentioned it was the depend on the value so that's why i think the still now if you ask to the any kids i think in definitely they will if you ask them what is your aim in life I think very commonly they will do, I like to be a doctor, I like to contribute to the society. But it's not the real fact. That is the one of the reasons I'm sure that you will find a lot of the doctors after completion their education, they are entering to the other job which is not relevant to the doctor. Why? Because it is a failure of our education system. We are not find out the sort analysis. What exactly the talent and creativity and what is the beauty of the student is going on. What is their interest and where they should fit it for the in the future market because I should say that God, him, God also not created everyone for every job. God has also some specific intention to run the whole world, run, run the whole society. But it is a very bad luck our education system. We are not find out that who is fit for what job. And these sorts of assessment is completely absent in the primary education secondary education, higher education. I'm sure that that's need to be looked after. Otherwise, what happened? The, because as I repeatedly mentioned, and I, as I'm coming from an entrepreneurial background, I'm not an academician. So what I'm doing, you see, as a businessman, while I got the success of my business, so after 13 or 14 years of successful of my business running, I established the university in 2001 and 2002. So why? Because I'm not an academician, but due to cause of my entrepreneurial mindset, while I'm facing the problem to get the right people, right profession in my company, then I thought that I should establish the education institute. In 19, 1997, I established the one institute called Daffodil Institute of IT. And after seeing the success, then I drive my educational venture in the university. Now I have 27 plus educational venture. But at the same time, that is why I should say that, please, it is the time outcome-based education. I think this Honorable Minister is rightly pointed out, technology, industry. You see, industry is feeling shy to come to the education 
in the educational sector. At the same time, it is the failure of the academician also. I'm so sorry, don't misunderstand me. Because academician is also not eager to go to the industry because both of them come to the together. Because if the bride and groom not come to the together, I think no marriage should be happen. Every time we are telling to the in various session, meeting everywhere, we need the industry academia linkage. But you see, how, how many academician is going to the industry? So policy should need to be implemented. Government should need to give the right policy. Hey, academician, you must need to go to the industry and your KPI or your evaluation should be based on the industries. You see, the lot of cases our teacher is, they are publishing thousand, thousand journal. I'm so sorry again. I hope that don't get the wrong message. But all of the research, because in our university, there's a thousand plus COPAS index and blah, 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 a lot of things going on. Every time I, I fought with the teacher, please go to the commercially viable research. Make the change of the country. Because you know that the UN is last September, I think, honorable minister, two minister is already agree with me that UN is this time, they already focused to the education sector mostly. Why? Because they've clearly mentioned the development of the economy should be depend on the education. Because without ed proper education, I think country cannot be moved forward. So that is a key reason I should say that this is the time we need to analyze short analysis. We need to create the policy of the student. At the same time, of course, without thinking of the technology, it is impossible because COVID is giving a clear message. If the technology is not present in our society, I think in COVID time, I think two years, everybody will lose their education. Uh, we know that after 1990, 1980 due to cause of some political turmoil you know the i myself is one of the victim two plus years we lost our session job we i, I should complete my masters in 1986 but i completed my masters in 1989 why due to cause of the session job there was a political problem every time the political problem is going to complete close the university so we are the victim but luckily you see the covid 19 is giving us a very good and strong message to the society whatever method whatever problem whatever thing is going on, it does not matter. If you depend on the technology, you can run your whole education system, wherever you are, it does not matter. So that is the one of the indication that our, our society and our government and our decision maker, stakeholder, everyone got, the technology need to be adapted as much as possible. You know, the Google, YouTube, how much impact they are cre cre creating every day, we don't know. Maybe tomorrow morning, when you wake up, you will see there is another technology is coming. You know, the metaverse is already implemented. So now this is the time if we implemented the metaverse properly without going to the university or school or college, you can get all sorts of interaction with the teachers properly utilizing the metaverse. But only the thing is that, of course, there is a 20% or 30% shortage should be to physical interaction. Of course, we need the physical interaction. But 70% or 60% we can depend on the technological involvement because artificial intelligence is also understand my thinking, what I am thinking. But why education system is not thinking like as AI? Why education system is not developing? Because if you go to, go to the Google and YouTube, whenever you're searching, they realize that what your choice, and that's why they are sending you the advertisement, sending you the newsletter based on your choice. If you go to the club, they will send you the club. If you go to the fashion, they will send you the fashion related all material. If you go to the sports, they will send you the all sports related material. But why our teaching system is not find out who like to become the entrepreneur, leader, creative, scientist, these sorts of matter, I think this is the right time, high time, and thank you very much. The CGS for organizing such a wonderful event. I hope that they will bring the, all of the policy, all of the recommendation to the right decision maker. This is the time to wake up and think that technology and education plus industry, this three of that needs to be merged together. Otherwise, we lose our destination and we lose our young talent. Those I am seeing that they are sitting in front of us. They are the leader of the country. They can change the whole country. Because I myself, once upon a time, I was also a student like this. So what happened? This is the time for changing the society. Thank you very much and wish all of you good luck. Thank you, Shabu. I think that what you've really touched on is that, you know, we need to be thinking about the, the labour market again and that role of technology and how that is disrupting. Uh, but also without, you know, the broader forces, it doesn't get disrupted. There's kind of a, there's a, there's a, um, there's a juxtaposition there. And uh, let's unpack that in the questions. And finally, I'd like to go to Dr. Matul Alam from the Faculty of Education at the University of British Columbia, Columbia so all the way over to Canada. Good morning, Assalamu alaikum, adab, namaskar to all participants here and maybe those who are watching from other places. Uh, 
I have been uh, thinking about education system for a long time. I taught at universities in USA, Canada, and England uh, for 30 years. And I taught teachers and also those who want to become part participant in education system. But I find that I haven't done anything important in my life. I am very uh, fortunate today that for the first time we are having an opportunity to talk about educational policy issues in the context of Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a very uh, uh, important country in the world. It is one of the youngest country and I was a freedom fighter. I was in the student movement. There were many false cases against us by our uh, previous government. But what we have accomplished today is a significant number of human resources. We have 170 million people. I think we can change the world. Along with South Asian context, our children comprise 40% of the total children's population in school. If we can educate them properly, the world is with us and we can make the difference. But unfortunately, education system is very weak, not only in Bangladesh, all over the world. Education is the most neglected field. Even though I feel fortunate here to be sitting with former ministers and present ministers of education of our world. But unfortunately, they could not accomplish much because the parents' involvement was not there. Children's community involvement was not there. So I have started a dialogue with our policymakers in Canada. Uh, I met about five MPs. Uh, about uh, uh, many uh, other uh, intellectuals, including three ministers in the last th three weeks, to discuss about how policy could be improved. Policy could be knowledge-based, not politics-based. Policy could be statistics-based. As you can see, uh, we have 600 million children in this South Asian region, now uh, under 18 years. But the policy is coming for them from the government, from the society, even today, as you know, UNESCO is almost a dead organization for us. Uh, United Nations is almost dead organization for us uh, because of lack of education. Today, about globally, one-fourth of students are not able to read and write properly. Uh, those who finishes high school and primary school, many of them are operating almost two to three grade level below they are attending, like if they are completing grade five, they can perform only at grade two level after you, d you do the t testing. So what is happening uh, then in education system? First of all, as I mentioned, is the most neglected field. If you can see the after COVID, no education reform plan around the world. I'm not talking about Bangladesh only. Even in Canada, not significant work has been done. Student lost almost one and a half years worth of teaching and learning. But there is no compensatory program for that. One thing happened, good thing, is we now know that technology can help, as our uh, previous speakers mentioned. 
technology can help us to overcome the shortage of teachers. Those who are quality teachers, we are missing, in, especially in rural areas. The technology uh, used during this COVID period, in Bangladesh, not very significantly, only Vikram Nesanun school and few private schools used it. Government schools were not functioning properly. And we started alternative schools in rural areas in some places, but it didn't impact that much in terms of knowledge gathering. So now we have to rethink education. We have to ask our parliamentarians, even in Bangladesh, in all the countries, to discuss in the parliament how we can boost education. We do not need PhDs to make decisions in education. Our mothers are all PhDs. Our parents are all PhDs in every country in the world. We need to make policies based on what they think. So people's knowledge is the most important knowledge to build education system like Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar's mother did. Our parents did. We, we know education is the most important element in our future generation's life. We cannot cope with the global change without better education, quality education. Education has to be improved significantly and it is very much possible if we involve our communities, local knowledge, appropriate technology, and of course, knowledge economy based education system for all of us, uh, for all of the communities, all of the nations. In South Asia, we have shown tremendous uh, improvement in some areas. India have done significant work in teacher training. They have about 75% teachers trained, but Bangladesh is, is, I think, has to catch up with teacher training. Uh, and it can be using Zoom or other method. We have for very talented people like Salman Khan from Khan Academy. Everybody knows around the world. Everybody knows Salman Khan's Khan Academy, but our teachers do not know. We have to tell them how it works. We have to tell them about Coursera uh, from Stanford, uh, edX from Harvard, all the important aspects. So social media and other media needs to be used in education. We know how to solve problems using YouTube, but our teachers cannot help us. As I have been saying in Canada and other places around the world, India, China, that teacher, university professors know less than school teachers, and school teachers know less than their students. It has to be reversed. Uh, universities has to be prepared to promote teacher education. Today we have a president of Deputal University, we have president of some other universities, those who founded here. I have an appeal that please open up, open up teacher education department. Please open up, every school should have a compulsory teacher education department as a social responsibility initiative. And we have to train five to 600,000 <coughs> teachers in Bangladesh and also many teachers around the world, especially in South Asia. And, and uh, we need uh, universities like Open University of Bangladesh doing a great job. For example, they are training over 2,000 teachers uh, 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 in every cycle. Uh, and, uh, and Bangladesh has 
uh, a huge uh, teacher training need. And uh, of course, in the need of technology integration. And another important point I just mentioned, I must mention, that, that is the, the movement started on STEM, S-T-E-M, uh, it's uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. That should be incorporated in school curriculum. And uh, just tomorrow there is a conference starting in Australia, you can check uh, STEM. And uh, uh, the last year it was at my university in Canada, and uh, there were 400 uh, participants, uh, scholars from around the world. STEM can improve critical thinking skill of students, uh, collaborative work habit, and also the basic foundational knowledge for everyone, for example, going to foreign country to work from Bangladesh, uh, especially in Middle East, they all should have trained through STEM in, in the school system. That way they could get higher salary and, uh, and of course uh, they can improve uh, uh, their uh, work uh, environment. Thank you for this time and uh, if, I, if you have any question, I will be happy to talk Thank you. further. Thank you very much, Dr. Matiul, on your quite provocative comments there, uh, but also giving some really tangible ideas about what you could do in Bangladesh. Uh, we don't have a lot of time for questions, but we do have time for some. If there is anyone in the audience who has a question, I can see a lady here in the third row who's put her hand up first. Uh, we'll take a question. I think there might be a microphone on its way as well. There you go. Thank you. Can't hear on the microphone. Um, you might need to... Hello, everyone. Good morning to all of you. Thank you for giving me the floor. I am Saida Nazin Ahmed Sulvi, founder and president of Artpedia Global. It's a non-profit youth-led organization. <coughs> So my question is basically, I'm also working for education. My organization is also working for education. So after hearing from all of the uh, distinguished panels, um, I want to share a little bit that from my experience, since I work at the very grassroots level of our country, that I have, I'm working uh, since 2017. So I have, what I have seen that in the primary education, that there are so many schools at root levels that they don't have proper facilities. Like they don't have electricity, either electricity, other benches or uh, boards or teachers. Like they have schools, but there are not uh, efficient teachers or they have schools, they don't have students. All these are government schools. I'm talking about the primary government schools. And I'm also currently uh, serving as the president of a primary government, primary school managing committee. So what I have seen that uh, they don't get the facilities. So who are the responsible for such inefficiencies? We have schools. We have established schools of government primary school, but who are responsible for all these inefficiencies, first of all? Secondly, uh, since I am uh, uh, working at my own school as a president of the managing committee, what I have seen that teachers are not that efficient at primary level. As I have already completed my graduation, so what I believe that uh, everything starts from the root level or roots. So our roots is our primary education. So if our students don't get the uh, sustainable primary education, how can we expect to get a uh, sustainable higher education or secondary, higher secondary or uh, university level education? So what the governments or other uh, distinguished panels are thinking about it, what the governments can do to solve this inefficiency? Because it's a very vital issue. I, I think, am working I think, I think the former minister might have some comments uh -huh. to, to respond with. Uh, thank you very much for bringing to focus a very important thing because the primary education is the foundation of all education and unless you have a very good solid foundation, you can't build a building over there. In our country, the problem with this primary education is uh, we have infrastructure now built, but the lack of efficient teachers the recruitment policy of these primary education teacher in our country, I think there are a lot to improve. I agree with you that uh, we, our government cannot supply uh, the sufficient and uh, essential equipments in the primary school. 
and that's why in my uh, remarks in the panel as a panel member i uh, told of uh, increasing budgetary allocation because you know now the budgetary allocation in our country as a matter of fact in this area is very less we we do not even spend 2% of gdp in education sector i think the budgetary allocation should increase so that all the facilities can be provided in the rural areas and also in primary school and the most important thing is the recruitment of teachers we uh, with this salary present salary structure we cannot attract uh, uh, talents to be inducted as an primary education teacher so we must give them other facilities so that Uh, talents are attracted to teach in primary education sector and we can train them properly thank you thank you and if uh, we've got one more response just here uh professor uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> due to cause of time shortage i don't like to give you the yeah. details so please talk with me personally after this meeting my intention is that if you have the intention to implement something you can do it so i'll give you the one to one counseling thank you very much Thank you very much for that question and I think we're going to be kicked off the stage. There was one a couple of questions up the back but perhaps you could come and speak to the panelists afterwards uh, because we do need to wrap up. But if you could all please put your hands together for our wonderful panelists, different perspectives that we've heard today uh, from various countries and industry and government. Thank you all very much.